Well, it's been a while since I sat in this thing. Sitting in a Russian airplane for the first time, your G-Wiz meter goes up just a little bit. This program's existence was very, very closely held secret. We fly 16 MiG-21s a day, Tuesday through Friday, week after week after week. What were some of the things that needed to be done to keep it secret? The security of the program was paramount. If an adversary satellite was gonna be overhead taking imagery photos of our area, we would be in a hangar. We were prepping for World War III. Did the Soviet Union have any kind of similar training using American airplanes? Perhaps don't believe every story that you hear. What was the fastest you ever flew the MiG-23? It was a second and a half from idle power to full afterburner. The MiG-23 would not turn. How did we acquire these airplanes? The word secret is an interesting word, right? How did you simulate Soviet missiles? We had their stuff. It just doesn't get much cooler than that. Hi, I'm Chuck Stout, curator at the Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. And in this special, you ask for it, you got it episode of our Behind the Wings podcast, we're gonna go back for part two of our conversation with a person who was part of a top secret US Air Force program, Constant Peg. We'll talk to a pilot who flew the MiG-23 in the first of its kind adversary training program. And because this was such a popular episode, we'll also take a deep dive into your questions because that's what we do this for. This one's gonna be cool. So if you missed part one, go check that out on our YouTube channel. And if this is the first time that you've heard about our Behind the Wings podcasts, we've got a library of over 30 episodes that you can go check out wherever you get your podcasts. Now, if you want to see this MiG-23, come on down to the museum. You can see that and about 70 other aircraft and spacecraft. With all that out of the way, it's time to go Behind the Wings. Let's get started. John Mann, welcome to the show. Could you please introduce yourself? Well, thanks, Chuck. Yes, uh, thanks to you and to John Barry for having me up here. This is a great museum and you guys do great work. I'm, I'm really honored to, to be invited. Hey, I just uh, spent 24 and a half years in the Air Force flying airplanes, and I happened to have a chance to fly the, the MiG-21, MiG-23, and the Constant Pick program, as I think you know. And uh, that's what we're talking about today, I think. We'll get more into Constant Peg in a little bit, but I'd appreciate it if you'd go into how you got into flying sure. and tell us about some of the airplanes that you flew along the way. I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the Air Force Academy, graduated the class in 1973 along with John, where next door in, uh, I was in Cadet Squadron in 25, he was in 26, and that gave me a good springboard into going to, to pilot training. One of the key things that helped me a lot, our, my first class year, which is our senior year as a cadet, I went down to the second floor of Fairchild Hall where we had simulators and I spent several hours a week down there with the instructors there teaching me how to fly. They did a great job and they gave me a leg up on all my peers when I went to pilot training. It was a great prep. So I really owe a lot to those four instructors to help me get a good start. So I attended pilot training at Craig Air Force Base and when I graduated I got to fly F-4s. I flew those at McDill Air Force Base in Florida, Osan Air Base in Korea, and then Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. At Holloman, we changed to the F-15, and I was also uh, selected to attend the Air Force's Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base. And so all those things kind of came together and gave me a really good fighter background. I was able to fly as a trainee in the Constant Peg program, and then later I was selected to fly the airplanes themselves and be the trainer. So let's talk about Constant Peg, you know, as being kind of a solution to a problem. You know, what was the problem? We hadn't done real well in Vietnam, and so we had all these other training programs coming alive, Red Flag, dedicated adversary program called the Aggressors, and now the Constant Peg program. The lessons that were learned from Vietnam, I mean, they could have been sugar-coated and put in the file cabinet, but our leadership at the time was determined to make changes that were good. They were very visionary, and, and this red flag thing was, was a huge change from the 60s. Aggressors, a huge change from the 60s. You know, you and I used to fly against another F-4, and it might have big stripes on it, so we could know that that was a bad F-4, not the good F-4. It really hard to do. Similar training. Similar training versus similar. dissimilar training, and dedicated adversaries. A couple of very visionary people said, let's go get some of their airplanes. Let's get their stuff, and we fly it and use that for training. It's the ultimate dedicated adversary. Let's just go do that. 
and it was over the top, but it was exactly what we needed. To me, it seems like kind of a big jump from flying regular duty in an F-15 to ending up flying the enemy's airplanes in secret bases in the desert. Uh, how do you make that transition? The Air Force itself had uh, two gateways. You had to either complete the aggressor training program or complete the fire weapons school training program. And if you could pass one of those two, those were gateways that enabled you to be considered. And after that, it was pretty much a request to come out and interview, and you went through an interview process, and that would result in your selection. After you were selected to go and train against Soviet equipment at Constant Peg, tell me what that was like to show up as a student to learn to fight against the enemy's airplanes. Sure, and I'll do some context here. Remember, this was the post-60s, mid-70s, the Cold War was brewing big time. We had not done well in Southeast Asia. We were really working hard to fly well. We were wondering if we could beat MiG aircraft and so forth. And so to be selected to go up and train against the airplanes, my first one to train against was the MiG-17. I just remember getting up in the skies over Tonopah and seeing that airplane flying. And I went, wow, there it is. We've got it. And this guy's gonna teach me how to beat him. And then later in the week, the MiG-21 will come up, and that guy is going to teach me how to beat the MiG-21. We had their stuff. It just doesn't get much cooler than that. And so it was very exhilarating. By the end of the week, I felt very confident in how to handle myself against those airplanes. It was just huge, Chuck. Hugely good program. This was training that did apply, though, because we were prepping for World War III. I see. See, this was all about the next one. Let's do a listener question. One of our listeners ask, how exactly did U.S. pilots learn to fly Soviet airplanes? Were there manuals? Were there ground training classes before you got in the cockpit? Back history just a little bit, the Constant Peg program had MiG-17s, 21s, and 23s. By the time I got to fly the airplanes, the 17s were gone. There was an awful lot of, let's practice this on the ground, taxiing. Let's practice this just flying around a little bit. Let's practice this flying around a little bit faster. Baby steps to where they could actually fly the airplanes. We all started off in the 21 to get kind of used to the Russian system, kind of used to the Russian airplanes. It was a simpler airplane. And I want to try to project that as cool as we might have thought we were, sitting in a Russian airplane for the first time is you know, your G-Wiz meter goes up just a little bit. So we'd sit in it, crank the engine, shut down, crank the engine, shut down. And then in the MiG-21, we'd taxi it around a couple times and then just go fly it. And then some of us uh, then went from the 21 into the 23. I had been flying the MiG-21, so the newness of a Russian airplane wasn't quite the same thing. But the 23 cockpit is not well organized, I don't think. And so there's a lot of getting used to that kind of stuff, touching switches and so forth. And then we had, we're basically in-house instructor. We'd go over academics on the 23, how it, the systems worked and so forth. We'd sit in the cockpit, become familiar with the cockpit, taxi it around a little bit, and then close the canopy and take off and go fly. So procedurally, would that be similar to what you would do in checking out in a new American airplane? New to you? Basically, yes. Learning the systems, becoming familiar, and then flying it. But with the American airplanes, you have simulators. We have good documents and we have a two-seat airplane normally, not always, but normally you have a two-seat airplane that you have an instructor with. And the instruments read in feet and knots. <laughs> you didn't have simulators for MiG-21 or 23. Yeah. That's correct. Right. I'm surprised that uh, our people didn't get on it and create simulators just to have a, a more uh, diverse and safe training fleet. but. That was the old days when it was all analog simulators, I'm sure. Yeah, Chuck, and let's go back also. It was the Cold War was still on. This program's existence was very, very closely held secret. So to go out into industry and say, we need a simulator that does X, Y, and Z, it'd build a cover. Ah. So that's just not going to happen. So, John, you know, <laughs> these airplanes, when they came and you started flying them, what adjustments were made for an American pilot to fly a MiG-23? Well, first of all, of course, was the basic airworthiness. Our maintenance guys tore the airplanes apart, inspected, repaired, put them back together to make sure the airplane itself would fly. Within the cockpit, we kept everything as stock as we possibly could. The fuel gauge in the MiG-21 was horrible, but we kept it because we were trying to keep the thing as real as possible. Russian airplanes come with instruments that are metric, not how high are you in feet, but in meters. That's different. So we would put airspeed indicators in that we're used to, 
altimeters that we're used to, we would put a US oxygen system in so that some basic creature comforts were things we were used to. Other than that, the airplanes, we flew them like the, we got them. Of course, single seat airplane. There's single nobody seat. gonna be in the back seat checking you out. Right. Uh, explain a little bit about some of the challenges you had when your first time you flew. I remember there's a story about the taxiing the MiG-23. Well, the, the MiG-23 that we flew actually had nose gear steering. It also had a nose wheel brake. Couldn't work both those at the same time, they fought each other. So for taxiing, we turned the brake off and, and the nose gear steering on. Then for takeoff and landing, we used the nose brake. It was very, very helpful for stopping the airplane. It was just a level of complexity higher than the 21. The swing wings, the flaps were uh, not for maneuvering, the flaps were for takeoff and landing. A very powerful engine. It was a second and a half from idle power to full afterburner. That thing ran up just like that. And when you had an afterburner, hang on to your hat, you're gonna go fast. Yeah. And you're gonna go fast quickly. So there was that also. I had the opportunity in the 422 Test and Evaluation Squadron Nellis to be part of flying against the MiGs. Sure. One of the things that I found fascinating, you know, a profile that we did on one particular mission was I got behind the MiG and we started from there in a dogfight. Then he got behind me and we yeah. started a dogfight. And then we did 180 degree pass and, you know, did a dogfight. And I was surprised at how poorly the airplane turned you know, as it went, but it was fast. And I guess the tactic a little bit, if you want to talk about it, was more hit and run. Well, if you're talking about the 23, the MiG-23 would not turn. I mean, it just would not. You could pull about one G for every 100 knots. So if you wanted to pull six Gs, you'd be at 600 knots. And your radius of your turn is a function of the square of your airspeed. So 600 knots at six Gs compares, in your F-4, you'd pull six Gs at 420 knots. And if 16 or 15, you'd pull 60s at 380 knots. Those turns don't compare at all. There's no such thing as pulling too much lead against a MiG-23 because it is not going to turn inside your circle. So yes, the MiG-23 turned very poorly. And if you were to find a MiG-23 pilot that was going to try to turn with you, he was going to be easy to beat because he wasn't, wasn't very good. What was the fastest you ever flew the MiG-23? That brings up an interesting aspect to flying the airplane. When you put it in the afterburner, it, like I said earlier, the power was immediate and it was a lot of power. But within the cockpit, the throttle would actually lock into the afterburner position. I don't know why they designed it that way, but it did. And it actually took a, a second or two of effort to undo the finger lock and get it out of afterburner. In the meantime, you're really accelerating, especially if you're going downhill. So you could overshoot your desired airspeed by 100 knots and not know it. And then you have to come to that realization and do something to fix it. And while you're doing all that, the airplane is not shaking or vibrating. There's no cues to let you know that. It's a very awkward airplane to fly. So yes, hit and run was the way to go. If you did try to turn, it wasn't gonna work. Another aspect of this, John, was if I'm in an F-15 going against an F-16, well, we're both at 425, 450 knots, and so if the F-16 is gonna to try to flank me and get behind me. He's gonna be three or four miles off to the side. And we had criteria on our radars for assessing that and saying he's a threat, he's not a threat. But the MiG-23 had such speed that when we were going from long distances, we would ask our GCI to give us a 15 mile offset. So all the US trained F-15, F-16 pilots would go, he's too far off to the side, he's not a threat. And we would ask for the 10 mile rollout. And after 10 miles, we put in afterburners, smoke up to 700 knots, and you could close pretty quickly. So that was another, you're talking about fighting the MiG-23, that's another aspect of the 23. I don't want to come in close. I want to get way far away, get way back behind someone, and then run them down. But as an F-15 or F-16 pilot, you're saying, well, he's not a threat, but he will be in about a very short period of time. Well, that's what we learned. That was one of the things that we taught people was the F-15 and F-16 community had what we call drop criteria. He's too far away, I'll drop him. That worked against another F-15 and F-16, but it did not work against the MiG-23. And that was one of the lessons that we could learn at Constant Peg. A typical MiG-21 sortie would be three-tenths or four-tenths of an hour because it was, it's a point defender. So the F-15s, F-16s, F-14s would take off from Nellis, fly up to Tonopah, we wouldn't even take off until they were 100 miles away. And then we'd do our engagements and training, and we'd land, and they have to go back. So a typical U.S. fighter sortie is 1.2, 1.3.
our typical sortie was 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. In the MiG-23. In the, in the MiGs. In the yeah, MiGs, yeah. The 21 was a little bit shorter than the 23. And we would fly eight turn eight. We'd fly 16 MiG-21s a day, Tuesday through Friday, week after week after week. In the summertime, it's hot desert. In the wintertime at Tonopah, it gets pretty frigid. And we would get minus 25 degree wind chills, and we're still out there flying. And these airplanes, the whole time I was there, I only remember one ground abort. That's a pretty phenomenal sortie record. Those airplanes were built to fly well, and our maintenance guys flew well with them also. The MiG-23 was a little different. It was more complicated. We had less ability to forecast things that would break. So if something seriously broke, like a hydraulic line, we would down the fleet for a month or so while we figured out what had happened. So we could take all of our airplanes, which weren't that many, we could take all of our airplanes and inspect them and do what we needed to do to, to prevent that malfunction from, from happening again. So we're a little bit more cautious with the MiG-23s, but we flew a three turn three of those. One of our listeners asked a really good question. Sure. Uh, a lot of air combat involves missiles. How did you simulate Soviet missiles? Well, we did the same way we, we simulated a gunshot. We didn't actually have a gun go off. Uh, we would just get in position and we'd make a call that indicated we estimated we're in a good firing position. So we had approximate firing positions that we would use for the Russian ATOL missiles. That's their infrared guided missile. And if we achieved those parameters, we would make a radio call that says, hey, we think we're in these parameters. And that would be something we shouldn't have achieved. It would represent a point that we'd go to learn from and build a better constructive de uh, defensive maneuver for the pilot. Was there a gun camera film on the uh, mix? No. We did have instrumentation at the very end of the program, ACMI instrumentation. The Nellis ranges had towers that could record your position and so forth. And so we carried these big pods at the very tail end that we could be watched and we could reconstruct that way. But for the most part, no recording devices. U.S. airplanes that came to fly against us did have recording devices. But again, the security of the program was paramount. And so the tapes that they made were sequestered. We could use them for debrief, but they could not take them back home with them. And ACMI pods are usually carried on American airplanes. And what it does, you can have a computer tracking system that actually would tell you whether you had a good shot or not. But you only had that toward the end of the program. Yeah, very limited. We had a hard time mounting it and the compatibility and so forth. So we used it very little. All right, here's the most interesting question we got from our audience from the first session. Yeah. How did we acquire these airplanes? Well, that's a great question. Um, what's been declassified, what we can talk about, is the fact that we had the airplanes, John, and that we used them in training sorties. What has not been declassified is source information because, you know, that's country to country and stuff like that. But let's just talk a little bit about how MIGs are, make it throughout the world. So MIG stands for McCoyan and Guryevich. Those are the two designers of the MIG aircraft. So they'd build the airplanes, the MiG-15, the MiG-17, 21, 23, 29, all the MiG airplanes that they built are built there. And then either Russia would keep it or it would go to, a, at the time, the Soviet bloc countries, such as, well, Bulgaria, where this one came from. Uh, or it would go to a client state. So there'd be some within Russia and some outside the Soviet bloc with countries that were still aligned with the Soviet Union. So that's how those aircraft would be dispersed. And then that would represent opportunities to acquire. Yeah, so Chuck, on the airplane that we have here, I think it's interesting for the audience to understand a little bit about how we got it. Yeah, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was pretty easy because the client states weren't clients anymore. And a lot of third world countries, Ethiopia, Pakistan, you know, the smaller countries, they needed cash and they had sellable assets. So they can be had. Our MiG was made in 1984 in a factory in Dubna, about 40 miles north of Moscow. And it went directly to the Bulgarian Air Force, uh, along with several others. And Bulgaria only used it within their own borders for air-to-air -air, uh, combat. It flew there until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then a bunch of American businessmen and pilots pooled their resources and bought 10 or 11 MiG-23s from Bulgaria, shipped them to the United States, and 
their intention was with parts from these MIGs, they can assemble one or two flyable MIGs, fly them in air shows. What a toy for the guy who's got everything. They did build a flyable two seat MIG-23 out of it. And they started giving away the other airframes to museums. And that is how we got ours in 2019, I think it came to the museum. When we were studying about the MIG-23 and when we were in Europe, uh, during the Cold War. Tell us a little bit about how the commonalities of some of the equipment was actually NATO standard. Sure. Of course, I'm just talking about intel reports, which I think were probably pretty accurate. The Soviets intended to invade Western Europe, and therefore they wanted their equipment to work with ground support equipment that NATO had. So their, the NATO fuel trucks could refuel the MiGs, but it was all one way. Their stuff would not fuel our airplanes. Also, the MiG-23 had trailing link landing gear, which enabled it to operate off unimproved surfaces. So it could also land, stop on a very short distance, and operate forward locations in an invasive type force. Can you explain maybe one of the stories, uh, you know, because we're always interested in on how somebody handles an emergency. One of our guys had a wing sweep failure. Now, let me try to explain the gravity of a wing sweep failure. Wings were straight out for takeoff and landing. When they're straight out, you can put the flaps down. If you couldn't put the flaps down, your approach speed was 245 knots. If you couldn't get the wings forward, I don't know what your approach speed should be because we never talked about that. Mm -hmm. But one day, one of our guys came back to land and as he was trying to move the wings forward to land, he had the hydraulic failure. A line had chafed, caused the failure, and his wings were stuck, not all the way far forward the soft in the tower, supervisor flying the tower, and the pilot discussed what to do, and they did it in a matter of minutes. We didn't have an aircraft manufacturer we could call and say, hey, now what should we do while the guy's flying? We just had to figure out what to do on the fly. I think he flew final somewhere around 280 to 300 knots, and he was able to land it like that. I don't know how the tires survived the touchdown. That's an example of a malfunction that happened. We handled it, we downed the fleet until we figured out how to prevent that from happening again. When you look at the F-4 and then you look at the MiG-23, there's some similarities there. But it's fascinating to see the reverse engineering that we would see on our airplanes and then it would show up on theirs. Espionage. People steal from each other. You have a good idea, I'm going to steal it. That's part of the reason that we have classifications. That's part of the challenges that a country such as ours, we pride ourselves on free speech, on being open and so forth. But we have to protect some things. Stealing things from someone else, them stealing it from us, it happens and we have to work to prevent other people from getting our good stuff. You know, it's very obvious just from me looking at the MiG-23 how different that design philosophy is from American design philosophy. And I understand that that also extends to the Soviets' attitude about training, war making, directing uh, their, their fighter pilots. Within America, we tend to focus on our differences and we comp and we criticize and so forth. But when you get right down to it, we actually work pretty good as a team. We have pilots and we have designers and we talk a lot to each other. In the F-15 and I'm sure the F-16, we had software tapes that were modified. The pilots said, we need this, we need that. The designers would talk, we can give you this, we can give you that. And we would get an airplane that was really easy to fly in terms of switches, and man-machine interface, and we're really good with that. The MiGs show the opposite. Things that I think are important in the airplane aren't there. Switches are everywhere. You can't just go around the cockpit and flip things and be ready to go. You have to be very deliberate with everything that you do because nothing is intuitive. If you were to go talk to someone who flew those airplanes and trained in their system, you'd kind of get the same thing. This is not important to me because I'm a pilot or at the end of our engagement, you go to the northeast corner, I'll go to the southwest corner, we'll set up again, but they won't do that. Someone has to tell them real time, turn right to northeast. Wow. So one of the things that I got out of this program was the value of the US system versus the Russian system. We're a team, we work together with everybody. Those guys are very stovepiped. Now this is my opinion, but I would also point out that U.S. equipped countries that train under U.S. methods have done much better against Russian equipped countries training under Russian methods, whether it's the Israeli 67 war, the 73 war, anything you want to talk about, Desert Storm, the scorecard doesn't lie. 
the design philosophies are all different. The way they operate is different in every aspect of their society. I wonder why people even buy their equipment. Thanks, that's a great answer. And I would just advise to go back and see episode one, where we do a, a walk around of the MiG-23. You can see some of those differences of design philosophy. It's a very, very beefy landing gear. Another listener asks, you know, we had red flag, top gun, constant peg. Did the Soviet Union have any kind of similar training uh, using American airplanes? Well, the honest answer to that question, Chuck, is I don't know. Might they have? Of course they might have. Well, we sold F-4s and F-14s to Iran, and they went from being our client to a Russian client. So is the potential there? Absolutely. Did they do it? I don't know. How about the other one that was fascinating to me when we learned about the MiG-23 when we were studying the enemy was how they really just flew that MiG-23 for about 100 hours in the engine, and they replaced it. Yeah, I've heard a couple different numbers. I've heard 100 hours, 200 hours. The engine was not durable. You know, when you fly an airline flight, when the airplane takes the runway, it takes upwards of 15 seconds for their engines to spool up. The 21 was a second and a half to full power, and full power was a bang. So there was no consideration, really, when they built that airplane to having a 5,000-hour engine. It was a couple hundred hours, and you're going to have to fix something. John, uh, we've talked about the pilots, we've talked about the training, we've talked about the aspects, but let's talk about maintainers right now. Within our squadron, our maintenance guys were our heroes because they kept us flying well, but I will make that statement to every squadron I've ever been in. But with respect to the constant peg squadron, you know, an airplane arrives in a C-5 here. Let's, we want to fly this. Would you please inspect it? And they don't have training on it. They don't have tech data on it. They want to take the wings off. They don't have support equipment to hold the wings. But our maintenance team did that. In all airplane things, everybody talks about pilots this and pilots that. We really neglect the true heroes of any aircraft organization, but particularly in the case of the constant peg program our maintenance guys. Yeah, I think that's an amazing observation. I mean, you're getting something you don't have any background, any training, any manufacturing data on, and you're able to make it work. And as Chuck mentioned, the one you guys got from Bulgaria had been sitting forever. Well, if you're going to get a government to give you one of their airplanes, are they going to give you their best one? <laughs> so beside maintainers, talk about the supply challenges. Again, we're trying to keep the program clandestine. So you can't just go down to Las Vegas to a machine shop and say, make all these parts for us because it becomes obvious eventually that you're making stuff for something that these guys have never seen before. And that creates curiosity. So we would try to get stuff made from different places to keep the logistical train invisible to the casual observer. What were some of the things that needed to be done to keep it secret? The word secret is an inter interesting word, right? You and I have both have secret clearances. We can look at secret documents. But there's also a compartmentalization of some secret topics. Someone would come in on a Sunday. We would brief them on Monday on the program, and they would sign an affidavit that said if they talk about the program, they're going to go to jail. They'll, they'll be a felon. And they'd fly throughout the week in the program. They'd sign a second document that says, I no longer have access to this program. We also tracked satellites going by overhead try to keep the airplanes off the parking ramp, off the taxiways, when a foreign satellite was overhead. If an adversary satellite or a foreign satellite was going to be overhead taking imagery photos of our area, we would be in a hangar during that period so that we would protect the assets that way. Another piece of the security thing, John, Tonopah Test Airfield is in a restricted area. No one can just drive up to Tonopah and onto the base there. And other aircraft flying around can't just land there. If they were to land there with an emergency, of course they could do that but then we would sequester them and have a debriefing and so forth. So a lot of physical security in the airfield. We had the compartmentalization of the program. We had people signing affidavits, and that was all in an effort to keep this program closely held. We get this listener question all, a lot on the, the okay. previous episode. So Constant Peg was a very successful program. Dissimilar training is a great idea. It ended. Is there any current program that does the same thing? There's two parts to your question. One was the dissimilar dedicated adversary question. My understanding is that that is outsourced now at places like Nellis and places around the states where there are dedicated adversaries that provide what the tactical air forces need to train against. The second part of your question is, do we have a something constant peg like going on today? If we were to have something, I would expect that nobody knows about it. It would be a good indicator of our security 
that we don't hear anything. Agree. Yeah, we're getting towards the end here. Uh, what were some of the lessons that we learned from Constant Peg? Well, Chuck, at the individual level, we've gotten over buck fever. I've watched the airplane fly. I've learned how to beat it. But let's talk big picture at the Air Force level. You know, back in the 30s, a guy named Billy Mitchell envisioned a separate Air Force and advocated for that strongly. And the results have been pretty good. I would say that in a similar vein, we had a couple of lieutenant colonels and colonels and a, and a two-star general that had the, the audacity to dream of going out and getting the other guy's stuff and training with it. And they didn't have a lot of support at first, but they were persistent. They got an airfield built at Tonopah. They got all, all these hangars built, all the stuff up there. We executed the program with tremendous results. One of the huge lessons learned for me is that our Air Force, all of our military has to always be looking into the future and dreaming big and then making the big dreams happen. Otherwise we get stuck in a rut. You've had a wonderful career. You've done a lot of really exciting and adventurous things. What would you say to a person, a young person today who is hearing your voice and thinking, boy, that's something I could get into. Well, first, Chuck, you're correct. I've had a blessed life. I've had remarkable opportunities and I've been able to, to take advantage of them and, and do some really great things, not just flying airplanes, but mission-wise. To anybody out there listening to this, to this podcast, I would say if aviation is something that interests you, you should go out and pursue it. You know, just a few weeks ago, a woman who was 104 years old jumped out of an airplane from 13,500 feet. That is way cool. I mean, she is my hero. If you're older and aviation isn't going to be your career, you can still go sample it just like that woman did. So if aviation might be your thing, there's opportunities out there. And I would advocate for anyone to strongly advocate, go pursue your dreams. That is a great encouraging thing. I, I echo that and uh, I would also add that uh, wrenching can lead to, to flying and I paid my way through flight school turning wrenches in a, in a gas station. Uh, Good for you. The more you know about what you're flying, uh, the, the better pilot you are. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. John, retired Colonel of the United States Air Force, thanks for your stories. I think it's going to be a real benefit to our audience to understand a little bit more about our history and the significance of the challenges that we overcame coming out of the Vietnam War and going to the point where we really have had air dominance uh, by the United States for decades now. And with your story, I hope to keep it and excite people in the future to be able to do that. It's my pleasure. I'll come up anytime. You guys have a great museum. The schools you guys are, have got going for kids are great. Just like what America is all about. And I'm, I'm honored that you asked me to be up here and be a part of this. Wow, this topic had so much intrigue and interest that I knew it would be a fun one to revisit for part two. And I really loved when you told us about some of the differences between Soviet and American philosophies. What were your takeaways, John? One of the things that was particularly exciting about this segment was we were able to be able to tell a story about Constant Peg, where a lot of us who were fighter pilots during the 70s and 80s uh, got an opportunity to fly against the MiGs uh, that were flown by pilots like John Mann and get through that buck fever. Fee you know, the first 10 sorties, if, if you're in combat and you can survive those first 10 sorties, you have an opportunity to be probably successful. It's proven in, in combat many times. So by going and flying against the enemy aircraft and actually seeing what the capabilities really enhanced our ability to be more ready for combat and be able to be more effective in fighting enemy aircraft, particularly for the MiG-21 and the MiG-23. Well, that'll do it, folks, for Episode 30 and Season 3 of the Behind the Wings podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to visit wingsmuseum.org slash podcast to join the conversation and access the show notes. We'll be taking a short nap, I mean a short break, as we wrap up Season 3. But stick around, and if you want to come and see the MiG-23 or the F-4 or the other aircraft that we talked about, Please come visit Wings Over the Rockies in Denver, Colorado. We'd love to see you here. If you've made it this far, leave us a review. Or if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. It helps us a lot. And we really appreciate your questions and comments. And as you've seen, we do listen and we do get back to you. We'll see you next time right here on Behind the Wings.